This morning, I want us to look at what I think is a tremendously important passage for understanding who we are as followers of Christ and how we are to experience the life that God wants to give to us. The passage comes from Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 26, and it says this, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Listen to what he says. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. In Christ, we are all children of God by faith. And if we're all children of God, if every single person in here is a child of God, what does that mean that we are to each other? We're brothers and sisters, right? I mean, for all children of God, did any of y'all ever grow up in any little country church where they called each other brother? Brother Bob and Brother Jim and sister whatever. You know what I mean? I, I, I served a little church like that. Everybody, a lot of people called each other brother this and brother that. It's, man, you know what? We don't do that here. It'd be kind of strange here. But you know what? It's the truth. It's what we are to each other. You and I are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are family. And Paul is saying to the church at Galatia, he's saying, listen, all those things that distinguished us from one another, all those things that separate us, whether slave or, or, or free, Jew or Gentile, male or female, the, the distinctions of race, whatever it is, your past, whatever it is that separate us is now no longer the key part of our identity. The key part of our identity now is that you and I are children of God. And we are now family with one another. This is who we are. God has placed us into a family. See, when you come into a relationship with God, you don't just come into a new relationship with God. God places you into a family. The scripture says that we are literally born again. When we come to a relationship with God, we're born again. We start all over. We have a new relationship with God, but we also have a brand new family, and we all become a part of the family. Susan and I had some friends when, when I was in seminary. And their names were Laura and Marty Taylor. And Laura and Marty Taylor uh, wanted to have kids, but they couldn't. So they began the adoption process and began to adopt a, a young girl from China named Hannah. Uh, they, they worked the adoption process, but as they got close to the end of it, China said that you can't have the child. And so the adoption process fell through. It just so happened, though, that, that during that time, a young African-American baby had been born, and they were looking for parents for this young African-American baby. And so Laura and Marty, uh, who are very white, uh, adopted this African-American child into their family. Uh, not just a couple of weeks after they adopted this young African-American baby into their fam family, the Chinese government called back. And they said, we've changed our mind. You can now have Hannah. And so they left Sarah behind when she was just a little child, and they went and picked up Hannah, and they brought Hannah home, and now they had an African-American baby girl, and, and they had uh, Hannah the Chinese, and Sarah was the other young lady. And after they'd been home a few weeks, guess what they found out? She was pregnant. They had a very uh, a cute young boy, red-haired little boy, uh, and his name is Josh. And this is a picture of uh, Marty and the kids right here that Laura took. You know what? What a great picture. Yeah. They who are separated by so much have become one family. Those things that distinguish them from one another, you know what? They all get kind of lost because now that's just one big family. They are family. And it's a beautiful picture of what happens in the body of Christ. God calls us not only into a new relationship with him, but God calls us into a new relationship with each other where you and I become family with one another. And that's what Paul's trying to, to say right here is that, is that God places us into a family because it's a family that we need. God places us into a family because it's in a family that we grow and, and we mature and we become the people that God's called us to be in family. This is our design. God designed for us to grow, not as orphans out there by ourselves, but to grow just like little kids do. God places in a family, and it's in that environment right there where we grow and mature. 
That's why today we're celebrating grilling, chilling, and spiritual filling, as Stacy Moore so aptly named it, uh, our little get-together today. We're celebrating our life group ministry. We're celebrating our attempt to put people in groups where they get to know one another, because for us, life groups are where we really become family. Life groups are where we make connections with one another. Life groups are where we become known to each other. We begin to know some other people. Life groups are where we really do life together, where we build those relationships, where we experience support and care and accountability that happens in our small groups that we call life groups. Now, there's nothing wrong uh, with worship. Worship is important. What happens here when we're a big group gathered in this place, man, this is one of the central things that God created us to do. And worship is absolutely essential to our spiritual life. But if all you do is come to worship here at Grace, you're not going to experience a balanced Christian diet. Because worship is motivating, we hope. We hope worship is inspiring. We hope that worship fulfills what your soul was created to do, which is to worship God. But God designed you as well for family. God designed you to exist and to thrive in a place where people know you, where they know your name and they know your struggles, where they celebrate your victories and they celebrate your defeats, when they're there for you when times are good, when they're there for you when times are bad. That's the environment in which God created you to thrive. Susan and I, when we were in Costa Rica a couple of months ago celebrating our 20th anniversary, we saw a bunch of these big red flower things right here. And they were all over up in there. We were in the uh, rainforest in Costa Rica. These are just amazing. They get really big. They're, they're really cool. But just imagine this. What would happen if I dug up one of those plants with the cool red flowers and I stuck it in my suitcase and I brought it back to my house? Now, just imagine that I get past customs. I'm not arrested for doing this. And I get it back to my house, and I plant it in my front yard. What is going to happen to that plant? It's going to die. It may not die right away. I mean, if we have an August like this, it may be okay. But listen, the truth is, is that even if it lives, it's not going to be what it is in the rainforest of Costa Rica. It's not going to be as large. It's not going to be as beautiful. It's not going to be as bright. It's not going to be as as healthy. And it's not going to survive the extremes of weather that we have here in Arkansas, either the extreme winter or the extreme summer. It's not going to survive those extremes because it was designed for a certain type of environment. And it's only in that kind of environment that it thrives. Listen, the same applies for you and I. When we are coming to a new relationship with Christ, God puts us in a family. And God puts us in a family because you and I were designed to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ in a place where we experience support and care and accountability with some other Christians. And outside that, we may be okay. We may not be bad. We may be decent, but we'll never experience the height of what God wants us to experience in this life until we learn to live into our design, which is for community, to be surrounded by some people who know us, the good, the bad, our joys, and our struggles. Now, when when you hear about this, one of the things that the writer of Ecclesiastes writes about is he writes about the joy of simply being in community with other people. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, is a passage that we often hear about read at weddings sometimes. But the truth is, is that the writer of Ecclesiastes is not writing simply about the marriage relationship. The writer of Ecclesiastes is writing about a life lived with other people. He's writing about the power and joy when we do life together, when we live into the design for which we were created. That's what he's talking about here. And in Ecclesiastes 4, beginning in verse 9, he begins to tell us some of the tremendous benefits of living into our design, being the people that God called us to be. Listen to what he says, beginning in verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. What's the writer of Ecclesiastes saying about the life lived with other people? He's saying you're more productive. You're more productive when you live life in relationship with some other people, when you recognize you're designed to live connected with others. In in the first service, I talked about uh, NASCAR, and I made the mistake of mentioning Jeff Gordon. Apparently, he's hated, all right? So I'm not going to mention Jeff Gordon, all right? I'm going to pick somebody else. I was told I should use Mark Martin, all right? So imagine Mark Martin. Any NASCAR fans in here? 
You guys, all right, you guys will relate. Imagine Mark Martin. I mean, he's a tremendously talented guy. I mean, he's a super good driver on the NASCAR thing. And so a lot of people like him. And just imagine this, though. What would Mark Martin be like by himself? I mean, if it was just Mark Martin and nobody else, how successful would Mark Martin be? Not very, right? I mean, because he's got guys who, who create the engine. He's got guys up there who are telling him when to pass. He's got guys doing marketing for him. He's got guys in pit row who are changing the tires when he zips in there to pit row. And the truth is, is that Mark Martin might be a decent guy. He might be a decent driver, but he would never be a NASCAR champ unless he had a whole team of people with him. There's only one way that you get to a certain height, a certain level of performance in NASCAR, and that is that you build a great team. It's the only way that you soar. So we recognize that. Most of us do. Maybe in our business life, uh, at work, we recognize that if we're going to really achieve, we've got to build a great team. But many of us fail to recognize that that applies to all the rest of life as well, simply because it's the way that God designed us. Listen, your marriage will be better when you're living with some other people who know your struggles and your joys. When you share with some other people what life is like being married to this other person who's very different from you. When you're doing that with some other people, it's going to take your marriage to a brand new level. Listen, your parenting is going to be taken to another level when you get together with some other people and you share your struggles and you share your joys and you share what you're thinking and you share some knuckleheaded things that you do with your kids sometimes. When you get together, you're doing life together. It's going to take it to the next level. Your spiritual life, your spiritual life was designed to be lived in connection with some other people. It's not you and God in the Bible off in some corner. You were meant to live connected with a family. And when you've got other people who are giving you support and care and accountability as you seek to be faithful to God, you're going to find that only then do you experience the height of what God wants to give you in your spiritual life because only then are you living in your design. You were created to exist, to thrive, to work in community, in relationship with some other people. That's your design. And the writer of Ecclesiastes says, we're more productive when we're doing that. He goes on in verse 2 to say this, If they fall down, they can help each other up. But pity those who fall and have no one to help them up. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, not only are we more productive when we're with other people, he says we're more resilient. Pity the person who falls down and has no one to pick them up. You know, many of us know Psalm 23. If you don't know any other scripture, many people know that verse right there. And I think one of the reasons that Psalm 23 resonates with so many people is because it's an experience that we all have. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You know, many of us, and that scripture has resonated with people throughout the centuries because all of us, all of us walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Nobody escapes that experience. In this world, we experience brokenness. It can be financial. It can be relationship. It can be spiritual. All of us fall, sometimes because of our own stupid decisions, sometimes because of things other people do to us. But we all experience fallenness. We all experience brokenness. We all understand what it's like to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It happens to all of us. And pity the person who has no one to pick them up. No one to reach down and to help them to get back on their feet again. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, we're more resilient when we're together. You know, most of us have insurance. We have insurance for all sorts of things. We have car insurance and health insurance and life insurance and home insurance. We've got insurance for everything. And there's a reason that we have insurance for everything. We recognize that sometimes things happen. Houses burn, tornadoes come through, cars get wrecked, uh, you get sick, you have to have surgery, and you recognize that without that insurance, that these events, which, which may not be a big deal when you have insurance, be, can become huge, devastating events when there is no insurance. I mean, if your house burns and you have no insurance, that's pretty devastating. It's devastating already. It's more devastating when there's not insurance there to back you up when those devastating things happen, right? So we, we, we have that insurance, and the insurance not only helps when bad things happen, it helps to know that you've got insurance. I mean, you kind of go through life feeling a little bit better when you know how, you know what? Man, I know people wreck their cars, but at least I've got insurance. 
insurance. I know people get sick, but at least I've got insurance. And, and some of you have lived without insurance. And you know the anxiety that that produces when you think, man, if I crash my car, it, nobody's going to help me. If I get sick, there's no, going to be nobody to help me pay my bills. You understand the anxiety that's produced when you don't have that. It's there to help us when bad things happen. You know, the writer of Ecclesiastes said the same thing about a team, a community, a group of people that you're living life with. They're there. They're there to help you when you fall and to pick you up. And not only are they there for those bad times, but it means you go through life knowing, hey, you know what? It's okay. I, I recognize that times I'm going to fall, but I've got some people who are going to pick me up. I know I'm not alone. I know that when I fall, there will be some people who will surround me and love me and pick me up and get me back on my feet again. He says we're more productive when we live in our design. He says we're more resilient when we live in our design. He goes on to say here in verse, in verse 11, Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? He's simply trying to convey to us, the writer here, is that life is more enjoyable. The idea of warmth, of comfort, of joy, that when we live life together, life is more enjoyable when it's shared with some other people. If you would go to my Facebook page, you would sometimes, on a regular basis, see pictures that look a little bit like this. All right, that's like an eight-pound bass. You can't tell because of the camera angle. <laughs> trust me, just trust me. It's, it's a big one. All right. Now, who do you think took that picture right there? That would be me. I took that picture. I was out fishing by myself, and I love to fish. I love to catch fish. All that's fun to me. I mean, it's a beautiful day. I'm out there on the lake. I'm catching fish. And, I man, the first thing I do, I mean, I catch that fish. I pull it into the boat, and I, I look around to see if anybody else is around. Nobody was. And you know what? I just wanted to share that. So, I, I mean, I take a picture of it, and, and, I'm picturing, and I share it on Facebook because, you know what? Something in me just likes to share things like that. I mean, I want to share it with my friends. And not that everybody on Facebook is my friend, but there are people who will look at my picture of my fish. <laughs> Something in us likes to share. Listen, that's God designed. Listen, we, we were created to share our life with other people. And sometimes life just feels a little less when we don't get to share the joys and, and the victories of our life. Even when we get to share the sorrow and the struggles of life, life was meant to be shared with others. And Facebook has plugged into that. I mean, it's the success of Facebook that they've plugged into a God-given design that we have to share life with other people, that somehow life was meant to be shared with others. It plugs in, and the writer of Ecclesiastes says, man, God loves you guys. And because God loves you guys, God wants you to experience this joy that you want to experience outside of his design. So God plugs you in, surrounds you with some people who will support you and love you and care for you and, and hold you accountable so that you enjoy life more. Life's more enjoyable when we're connected together. It's more productive. We're more resilient. He goes on here in verse 12 to say this. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. He simply says this. We're less likely to fall when we're bound together with some other people. Not only is there somebody there to pick us up when we do fall, but we're less likely to fall in the first place when we live life together. Have y'all ever watched somebody make a really stupid decision? <laughs> yeah. Most of us have. I mean, you watch people make really stupid decisions. And the thing about it, when they were making that stupid decision, many times you recognize they convinced themselves that their stupid decision was a good idea. Right? Have you seen people do that? We have a tremendous ability to deceive ourselves. We have a tremendous ability to deceive ourselves, to convince ourselves that what we want is actually good for us. And so that's the reason that we've watched people make really, really dumb decisions. They convince themselves that it's a good idea, and you're looking back going, man, that's the dumbest idea ever. Right? We've all done that. Do you think anybody's ever watched you make a really dumb decision? And don't you know that the other people have watched you do the very same thing, that you have convinced yourself that something's a good idea? When the people around you can all clearly see that it's a really, really bad idea, but, but you alone figuring it out for yourself, you don't need community, you didn't ask anybody else, you just convinced yourself what you wanted to do was the right thing, and everybody, it was clear to everybody else around you that it was a really, really bad decision. 
I was in a small group of guys for about 10 years. We met together. Uh, once a week, we would meet together, and we would just share life together, and we would share our decisions together, and we would just, we would just run stuff by each other. You know, whether it's buying a new car or something that was going on with our wife or, or some discipline thing with our kids, we would just, uh, if we were going to make a big decision, we said, you know what, if you're going to make a big decision, seek some counsel. And so we would ask each other. And, and it got to be a joke in our group because we knew one of the sure signs that we were about to make a, a bad decision was this. We didn't ask the group. One of the sure signs that we were about to make a bad decision is that we didn't bring it to the group. Now, we made excuses for why we didn't bring it to the group. We would say, you know, we didn't have time to talk about that, or, or I need to miss this week because I had to get donuts or whatever it was. But as soon as we didn't want to bring it to the group, we began to laugh and say, you know what, man, I knew I was doing the wrong thing. Because if I was doing the right thing, I'd have brought it to the group. I mean, I'd have come and said, guys, give me your, give me your advice on this. What, what do you think I ought to do? We continually messed up over and over again. We eventually learned a little bit that that was a bad idea. That was a bad idea. It almost never ended good. When we would avoid the group and do our own thing, it almost never ended good. We're less likely to fall when we're connected to one another. This is the way God designed us. It's not that you're weak. It's not that there's something wrong with you. God designed you for community. And it's only in community that you reach the next level of the life that God wants to give to you. It's only when you're connected to some other people. So let me ask you this. Who's there for you? Who's there for you? Who is there in your life that makes you more productive? Who's there in your life that you know that when you fall, they'll be there to pick you up? Who is, who is there in, in your life that keeps you from making stupid decisions? Who is there in your life that, that when something really good happens, you pick up the phone and say, hey, guess, guess what? I just got this promotion. I mean, this just went right. Who is there in your life that when things go south, you pick up the phone and say, hey, listen, man, this was really bad. I just got in a horrible argument or I just got whatever. Or I just made a stupid decision. Who is there that you share your life with? Who does that for you? See, if, if you don't have that, life may be good. It may be decent. You may not be a bad person. I'm not saying anything at all. You're, it doesn't mean that you're not Christian. It just means that you'll never experience the height of what God wants to give you until you live into your design. Here at Grace, we're trying to help us recover that. Uh, we do it through our life groups. If you're not in one, I encourage you to think about, is God calling you at this season of life to be a part of a life group of people who are living life together? Maybe you say, you know what, life group doesn't work for me, but maybe you can call two or three people together to meet them for breakfast or lunch or coffee or dinner or on the weekend. Maybe you guys could meet every other week. If you're a guy, find you two or three guys that you want to meet with and just, you know, open up your eyes to those men that God wants to surround you with to do life together. If you're a woman, who, are there two or three women that, that you could just meet with on a regular basis somehow just to, to create that kind of network so that you experience and live in the design that God has called you to? This is the way that life gets really good. When we recognize our design and we live into that design that God's given to us to experience community. Let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for your great love for us. Lord, I thank you that you have designed us for community because you love us. Lord, you want life to be more productive. You want us to be more resilient. Lord, you want there to be somebody to pick us up when we fall. Lord, you want to keep us from making stupid decisions. Lord, you're making us stronger and better and sturdier. We praise you for all those things. And Lord, I just pray that as, as you knit us together as a family, that you would help us each one to find a few people that we can trust our life with. We'll find some people who will support and care and encourage us in our Christian journey. Lord, I especially pray for those who are here today who feel disconnected, for those who feel lonely, for those who are searching for some friends to walk with them, Lord. And maybe it seems, maybe it seems hopeless. Maybe they look around and say, I, don't, I just don't have anybody like that. Lord, I pray that you would bring the right people into their life. I pray that you would just open up their eyes to see that, that those one or two people that they could, they could meet with on a regular basis that could uh, help them experience the fullness of the life that you designed us for. God, we love you. I pray that you'd help us as a church with our life group ministry. Lord, that we would connect more and more people to one another for study, for care, for accountability, for strength, for support. 
that we as a church might become all that you have called us to be. Lord, we love you and we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.